started. So I'm going to mute everybody except for Larry. I'm going to unmute you. And again, I'm just going to ask you all to, uh, to hold questions until the end, and we'll have you unmute yourselves at the end or type them in the chat box. And uh, I want to thank you all for joining us. Really appreciate it. Um, we had this scheduled long before the COVID crisis, and Larry was gracious enough to, to move from an in-person talk to a virtual talk, which is the way of the world right now. Um, we're very grateful. And I think because of that, in some ways, there's a bit of a bonus is that we get to um, maybe even see more people than we might have in person. I know we have some people from all over joining us, all over the country, never mind Massachusetts. So welcome to you all. Thank you so much, and thank you for supporting the museum. And one more big thanks to Marble Harbor Investment Council. And I do want to turn it over to, to Larry Sands, who many of you probably uh, recognize from uh, Glover's Regiment, as well as um, his work around town. And he's here as the um, chairman of, of the Fort Sewell Committee. So welcome to you, Larry, and thank you so much. Thanks, Lauren. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining. I'm excited to be here and happy to share some of the exciting things that are going on at Fort Sewell. The, the topic of yesterday, today, and tomorrow kind of gives me lots of latitude um, to talk a little bit about the history of Fort Sewell, um, the current state. Um, for those of you that like to walk around Fort Sewell, I know that that's a challenge uh, right now. Uh, but then we'll also talk about some of the things, some of the improvements that you'll see at the fort uh, by the end of September when we finish the uh, current project that's underway. Uh, you'll notice as I go through the presentation, I have lots of photos. I'm a great plagiarizer when it comes to uh, wonderful photos. And a lot of generous uh, photographers have shared their work, such as I. Lauren, Wednesdays in Marblehead. Dan Dixie has been very generous in sharing some of his collection. Jared Charney. Um, I've done my best to give photo credit uh, when I when I know the photo credit, but there may be a few in here that don't have proper attribution, and I apologize in advance for that. Uh, but I, what I tried to do was give you a, a visual representation of kind of how Fort Sewell has evolved over the years uh, and where we are today. So with that, um, I will maybe start if my name. Only if I can move the slide. So if you bear with me for one second. Try this again. There we go. Okay, so Fort Sewell has been uh, protecting the mouth of Marblehead Harbor since 1644. Um, I thought this headline really was a great summary, a source of pride and protection. When you look at some of the history of the town, Fort Sewell in the early days, in the 16 and 1700s, was one of the town's largest expenditures, uh, was building the fort, was updating the fort, um, was staffing the fort to protect our source of income, which was the harbor. So if you think of Fort Sewell as the last thing our fishermen saw when they went out to the banks and the first thing they saw on the horizon as they returned home, uh, Fort Sewell has uh, owned a, a commanding presence over the rest of the town. Um, those of us that live in Marblehead today don't see that so much. Uh, in general, we're, we're not firing cannons to protect our sailboats, uh, but in uh, days gone by, uh, the fort was a great protector of the shipping that was done from Marblehead Harbor. Uh, so we protected our sailing fleet, our fishing fleet, uh, it protected us through many conflicts uh, from the American Revolution, through the War of 1812, uh, up through World War II. Uh, there were coast watchers that were assigned to Fort Sewell. Uh, and one thing that happened historically is the fort was 
updated and enhanced many times. And generally those enhancements went along with uh, whatever the conflict was of the day. Um, so I'll try to talk a little bit about um, how Fort Sewell has evolved through the years. Um, if we think of the first 375 years, it's hard to imagine that uh, going back to 1644, uh, 2019 was the 375th anniversary of Fort Sewell. We do have another important milestone coming in the future. Uh, it's only the 100th anniversary, but it's the 100th anniversary of the return of Fort Sewell to the town of Marblehead from the federal government. And that happened in 1922. So prior to that, uh, Fort Sewell was owned by the government uh, and uh, manned by uh, troops of uh, government units. If we look back, um, this is actually an old chart going back to the 1800s of what Fort Sewell looked like. This aerial view uh, and we'll have, I have a few more charts that I'll share with you later, but if you, this would be the entrance to the fort. It's upside down here just because that's the orientation that we're used to seeing. So where my cursor is on the screen up in the top left corner is the entrance where you would walk into the fort. The area up here is where the benches are today. And this area is a gun platform, which is about 30 inches below the uh, summit of the earthwork mounding of the fort. So again, the, air, the top of the earthwork is the area where the benches are. And these platforms at the bottom of the fort and the top of the fort were about 30 inches below that. And that's what protected the cannons uh, from enemies that potentially could be shooting at Fort Sewell. Um, this is a, a very interesting uh, detailed chart from 1820. I'll talk in more detail about it later, but the interesting part is all the elevations were here. So we knew exactly how tall the ramparts were. So how tall was it to get to the top of the earthwork uh, mounding around the sides of the fort. And we were able to use this information. Um, we overlaid this with current information about how the fort is set up today and are able to return some of the features that existed back in 1820. And um, you may say, why 1820? Why is that an important period? That's the detail of how the fort was outfitted during the War of 1812. And if Fort Sewell had its one moment of glory in the sun, it's when Fort Sewell protected Constitution uh, being chased by two British frigates in 1814. Uh, so this is how the fort was set up uh, at that point in time. So I think that's a pretty interesting uh, it, it's always difficult, I think, when you look at historical locations to try to determine what's the period we want to go back to. Um, and you can't necessarily um, exemplify all of the details from all the different periods. So we've done our best to try to recreate um, the details of Fort Sewell uh, at its uh, most important moment in history. Uh, the last year has been rather interesting uh, in terms of storms uh, and in terms of a, 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 an iconic uh, item that has been at the fort for a very long time. For those of you that visit the fort often, you'll know that we lost um, the iconic tree that stood sentinel at the mouth, uh, at the, the point of land uh, at the uh, harbor side at the upper ramparts of the fort. So there is a tree that had been planted in 1873. And with the assistance of Dan Dixie, we were able to isolate the time by looking at photographs. Uh, so this is a photo of the fort from 1870. 
and you'll notice there's no tree. Um, as we move forward in time, we have a similar photo from 1890, uh, which shows the iconic tree here that I'll circle with my cursor um, that is fairly good size, probably 15 or so years old, uh, and then really nothing else at the fort. No other buildings uh, that hadn't been any houses completed at the fort at that point in time. And then as we continue through the years, we see how the tree increases in size. Uh, going back to 1912, uh, we have some additional photos of the fort, uh, postcards um, that show how the fort was structured at that point in time. Stairways a little different than they are today, uh, but the, the fort itself, with the exception, it looks the same today with the exception of the signal tower that was up on top of the fort. And this is where um, they flew signal flags to show if there were hurricanes coming. Uh, and then this small structure in front of the fort uh, is something that uh, doesn't exist today as well. But otherwise, um, the hillside is that been changed a little bit. It will it, to try to uh, solve some erosion problems through the years, and we'll work a little more on that. And I'll talk some more detail about that going forward. The stairways are similar to the way the stairways are today, and this little wall, the wing wall, uh, again uh, was another protection uh, that allowed the banking to stay in place to protect the casements at the fort. The last couple pictures are really uh, homage to the iconic tree. Uh, we lost it in a storm uh, in uh, last summer. Uh, we had a, a big blow from an odd direction and we lost a number of trees in town. Uh, unfortunately, this iconic tree was held together with a number of guy wires. Uh, we did our best to have this tree limp along through the last several years. And um, the storm um, came from an odd direction and the tree just couldn't withstand uh, the forces coming from that direction. So there were lots of uh, cracks in the tree, water had gotten in there, created some rot. Uh, and added, had some weak points that uh, caused it to topple over. And that's the last photo um, of the tree prior to taking down uh, the last vestiges of it. I'll talk a bit about what we've done to try to salvage some of that history. But the big challenge that we had was we had arborists come in to talk about the tree and if anything could be done to save it. Um, you'll notice that there was some additional growth. Uh, the problem we had is the two largest branches that remained, this branch that hung out here over the benches and the second branch up at the top here, both had, had significant cracks so that those branches would have to be taken off from a safety perspective, which would have left nothing from the rest of the tree. So unfortunately, that's uh, was the final decision that we had to take the, take the remains of the tree down. Uh, so it's the end of an era uh, at Fort Sewell, and I think you'll see that the skyline is forever changed. One of the interesting things that I noticed um, the morning after, I live on Franklin Street and walked down to the end of the street and looked up at the fort, and with all the parts of the tree that were now gone, I could see the American flag. Uh, and prior to that, it had always been hidden behind the foliage from the tree. Uh, so while the skyline has changed, um, there's something equally powerful about uh, having a flag flying at the fort and being able to see that from other points in town. So it's been interesting. Fort Sewell is a very popular place in town. It's visited during all seasons. I particularly love the dog in this picture. I honestly don't know which 
you know, what the year is that this was taken, but the group seems very well prepared for, uh, for being out in the elements. And you'll notice that people visit Fort Sewell uh, 24 hours a day and 12 months a year. Uh, so it is, it is a, a wonderful spot to visit, even in inclement weather. People are up there in hurricanes, watching the waves, watching the wind. Uh, and it is definitely one of the most visited spots in Marblehead. Uh, again, this was uh, recently published. I think the museum published this. It is from um, a calendar, or a, uh, a book actually of Marblehead. S is for Sewell, for Fort Sewell. This was Glover's Regiment drilling at the fort in 1975 when they were first uh, called back to duty by the town. Ah, so I'm just looking at Lauren's note that says it's a Fred Lichman photo, so likely from the first decade of the 20th century. That was the previous one of um, the folks uh, promenading at the fort in the snowstorm. So again, I mentioned Fort Sewell is visited 12 months a year and 24 hours a day. It's amazing to see how many people on a warm summer night walk around the fort at two o'clock in the morning. Um, they do it on cold winter's nights as well, but it, it's a very popular uh, spot for everybody in town to visit. trying to get my uh, computer to unfreeze here at the moment. So bear with me. Come on. Hang in there, Lauren. I haven't, <laughs> I haven't lost it yet. Hang on. That's all right. These things happen. You still have share screen capability? Yeah, I'm looking okay. for it now. So bear with me. Yeah. Sure thing. Yeah, probably. Yeah. You should get something that pops up that tells me share screen. Um. Yeah, if you're in the app or when you go down to the bottom, it should yeah. have a the mute stop video security participants share screen. There, there we go. Thank you. Yay. Thanks, Anna. What happens when you have children at home? They become your tech support. <laughs> Yay for the youth. <laughs> Absolutely. Come on. Okay. Okay. So um, that's a little of the history of the fort. Um, we'll talk a bit about how things are today at the fort and then. Uh, close with talking about where we're going in the future. I mentioned the uh, the windstorm that we had last summer. Uh, this was the some of the damage done to the iconic tree 
Um, the day after the storm, I was up at the fort and the Parks and Recreation and tree departments took 25 truckloads of branches out of the fort uh, from five significant trees that were damaged. Uh, one of the trees came down and, and dismantled two benches at the fort. Um, others along the wall, uh, the stone wall to the left as you enter the fort, about two thirds of that tree came down and then many branches from other trees uh, also came apart. Uh, so we got us to where we are today, which is uh, working on a project at the fort. Um, I'm part of the Fort Sewell Oversight Committee, uh, as Lauren mentioned. That's actually a committee uh, formed by the Board of Selectmen uh, to make recommendations and try to implement an improvement plan for the fort. So one of the things we did is had a structural engineering survey done um, to try to uh, look at the fort and determine how we can prepare it for the next 375 years. Um, so that included um, surveying the uh, brick and mortar uh, of the fort proper. Uh, it also looked at um, what the customer experience is for people that visit the fort uh, to see how we can improve that. Uh, and third was looking at the history of the fort and trying to improve um, how we educate folks on how the fort has been used through the years. Um, so this is a sign that's just on the hill as you start up the, the uh, Fort Sewell Terrace to get to the fort itself and um, shows you all the improvements that are being done, also alerts people that the fort is closed to the public at the moment and kind of uh, some of the work that we're doing uh, to try to improve things. This is the very welcoming sign that you see uh, at the entrance to the fort these days. Uh, we took out the swinging gate and put in a construction fence. Ultimately, when the work is done, there'll be a bollard or a uh, hole that's about 36 inches high in the middle of the entrance. So it'll be a bit more welcoming, but it will block enough of the area so that vehicles can't drive into the fort without removing the, the bollard. Uh, so I think that'll be a good improvement as we go forward. Uh, work is underway. Uh, the work has been divided into two projects. The first project is nearing completion, uh, and that has to do with masonry, um, redoing um, the areas surrounding the two doors at the upper part of the fort. So there's a munitions bunker and a door at the top of the stairway. Two or three years ago, we, we repointed all of the stonework on the facade of the fort. And this is a similar exercise uh, that we're doing with the brickwork uh, at the upper part of the fort. And we'll also replace the two doors that are there and the grates over the doors so that they can be open to let some airflow through the fort. Uh, so that's, uh, that's the first phase of the project. The second phase, and I'll talk more about the details, involves uh, removing or replacing some of the stairways at the fort. So at the moment, there are uh, seven stairways, three on the upper area, the upper level of the fort, three at the lower level, and then one steep stairway in the middle that connects the two areas. All of those stairways have been removed and four of them are being replaced. So the three stairways at the lower section of the fort will be replaced and the steep stairway in the middle will be replaced. The uh, stairways on the upper ramparts at the fort uh, will go away uh, to be replaced by a ramp um, so that the area by the benches on the upper ramparts will be accessible via this ramp. Um, again, 
just to show you a bit of, of the excavation work that's underway today. Um, this is at the upper part of the fort. So there's a stairway on the left side where you see all the rubble. Um, the second stairway was being dismantled by the uh, front end loader that's digging that up. And then the third stairway is to the right and that is being removed as well. All of the benches at the fort have been removed uh, while we do some regrading on the, uh, the earthworks. Uh, but then they're being refinished, refurbished, and replaced, uh, albeit with somewhat different locations because of the ramp access and also because um, there is a uh, a gun platform at the top of the fort and it just didn't make sense for us to put benches in front of the cannon that we're going to fire over the top of them. So um, again, this was a couple weeks ago while the slats for all the benches had been replaced. Um, they subsequently, those uh, concrete supports have been removed uh, and all will be replaced later. Uh, also, if you looked in the gate, you might notice that the memorial rocks that are in front of the flagpole have been removed at the moment. So they're more being moved so that we can do work on the pathway and they will be repositioned re uh, so they're not going away permanently, but they have been moved for the time being. Um, on the, this photo or these two photos, give you a sense of how the um, accessible ramp will go from just inside the entrance to the fort up to the level where the benches are. Um, so they use this, uh, built this more for their use in trying to work at the, uh, on the pathways that go around the fort. This isn't, the ramp will not be this wide or um, this flat. Uh, so it'll look a little different in practice, but this was uh, how they needed to stage the area. And all of the pathways, so the area, the, the um, area in front of the benches is all being replaced. Um, and we'll have a, a more stable surface uh, for us to perambulate around the fort. Um, I mentioned the repointing of the brickwork uh, at the top of the fort. This on the left hand side, this photo is the door at the top of the stairway. So the room on the right hand side of the fort has a stairway that comes up here. Um, all the bricks have been a few repairs, but mostly repointed. Um, the granite coping has been reset here. And then the other doorway at the top, we're replacing some granite that had been missing. Uh, so I think uh, the, and the door itself is being fabricated and being replaced. On the right hand side, uh, this was our last meeting uh, earlier this week where we actually did some test pits here to determine how deep we had to dig before we got to ledge, <laughs> given that Marblehead is uh, very rocky. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't get as deep as we hoped we might get. So we're working on the plan for how to uh, get the grade so that it is ADA compliant. Uh, so we'll more to follow on that. That's a, an ongoing question. Uh, we also did seawall repairs. There was an override a couple years ago uh, for work on a number of waterfront spots in town, including uh, the seawall at Fort Sewell. Um, and we completed this work. This is on the side of the fort that faces the Barnacle restaurant. Uh, so it had been undermined and required some significant work there the same time that they were uh, doing work on Front Street on the beach and the seawall there. Uh, we completed some work at the fort with that. 
So that was not part of the improvements for the projects that are currently underway. Um, I showed the picture of the iconic tree uh, from October of uh, last year. Um, this was the sad exercise of taking the tree down. Now we decided on a plan for, you know, if life gives you lemons, you try to make lemonade. Uh, so we decided that we could make good use of the wood from these trees. Uh, and we've contracted with a sawmill that has taken the logs uh, from the trees. And this is the Sawyer, Chris San Antonio, uh, trimming off some of the the pieces. Uh, we brought a logging truck down and that's actually the iconic tree that they were lifting into place on the logging truck. And all of this has gone to a sawmill in New Hampshire is being milled into lumber and dried for us. And we have a number of artists, artisans that have stepped forward and offered to make things from this wood. Um, some of which will be for sale, but other things will be donated to the fort with the proceeds of those sales uh, going to fund some of the cost of uh, the improvements that we're completing at the fort. Just to give you an idea, um, these are a couple of pieces that were milled. Uh, the iconic tree is a sycamore maple, uh, and these are a couple of the planks that came off one of the branches from the sycamore maple. So I think the, uh, the wood is going to be quite pretty, uh, and I'm sure that the artists in town will uh, make wonderful use of this. So um, I do have um, someone that's volunteered to coordinate this. So what I'd say is if you're an artist and you're looking to get involved in this process, um, you're welcome to contact me and I will put you in touch uh, with the folks that are gonna make this happen. Um, I believe we'll have a significant amount of lumber, uh, more than we anticipated. Um, so I think there will be opportunities for lots of folks that would like to be involved in that process. So stay tuned there. Um, a quick summary of all the things that were planned for the fort. It's a long list and I won't spend a tremendous amount of time on each of them, uh, but um, making the, the upper ramparts, so the area by the benches at the top part of the fort, uh, handicapped accessible. We felt we needed some fencing there um, in order to provide some method of protection, um, but we also wanted to not impact the view. Um, so we're, we've planned a low barrier fence similar to this two chains that'll be black and hopefully will kind of surreptitiously blend into the background. I mentioned replacing stairways and railings um, on the four stairways on the lower part of the fort. Um, accessible pathways. So every all but 22 feet of the fort will be handicapped accessible. The 22 feet are the steep stairway in the middle of the fort. Um, just given the amount of elevation there, it was not practical to find a way to ramp that. So um, somebody will be able to enter the fort. On the right side, there's a ramp here where my cursor is behind the restrooms that will take you up to the level uh, where the benches are at the top. So you'll be able to access everything from the furthest right most point here where the cursor is, um, around where the flagpole is today, to the base of the steep stairway. Uh, and then if you went in and turned left at the fort, you'll go up this hill, and this is the ramp up to the upper ramparts, which will take you all the way around to the top of the stairway. You would then also be able to return via the gun platform, uh, which is also handicap accessible. And everything down here, the rooms themselves at the fort, uh, we've changed the entrances and put a new flooring surface and a path 
that will take you to the fort so that everything down there will be accessible as well. I mentioned a cannon emplacement. So in the, uh, on the gun platform here at the top of the fort, we'll have one replica gun position. Um, we're remounting the earthworks and putting in the platform, which is how it was in 1820. Uh, we'll have a gun and carriage, and then we're also um, putting granite outlines of the cannons, so you'll be able to see what the different size cannons were that were that were part of the fort. Um, interior masonry were what's called reparging some of the brickwork inside the fort, uh, replacing so on the magazine itself, replacing doors and surrounding the bricks talked about that a little bit. And I think one of the most interesting things and probably one of the things I've heard most in my years with Glover's Regiment, people come to the fort and say, I've lived here 20, 30, 50 years and I've never been inside the fort. Uh, I'm happy to say that we funded uh, a fort ranger program where we'll have um, summer uh, employees of the town whose responsibility it will be to open the fort so people can go through and visit. Um, they'll be trained on how the fort was used and be able to take people through on tours. Uh, we've also set aside a maintenance fund um, to uh, handle ongoing maintenance at the fort. And one of the things that we've added as, as we've moved along with this project is to renovate the restrooms. Um, so we're working on how that's, you know, how the funding will work, but we believe we have enough money in with what we've raised uh, to be able to handle the restroom renovation as well. Uh, so how are we paying for all of it? Uh, to date, we've raised $589,000 in private donations. And I really have to say this is thanks to Charles Gessner and to Judy Jacoby, who have done the lion's share of the work in uh, getting those donations. Um, we've also received uh, grants totaling $205,000. One is from the Massachusetts Cultural Council Facilities Fund, that was $150,000. And then the Mass Historical Commission gave us a $55,000 grant uh, and then finally, the generous voters of the town approved up to $750,000 at town meeting last year and again at the polls um, to raise the money necessary to complete this project. Um, if you look at the money raised, um, we have raised about 72% of our original budget. So the original plan called for about $1.1 million, uh, and we've raised a significant percentage of that. Uh, we also, uh, through the hard work of Judy Anderson, have uh, received funding for some research grants uh, that will not only provide us some additional details on the history of the fort, uh, but also potentially some uh, opportunities for presentations to share that information with the public. So overall, um, I think uh, thanks to a number of members on the Oversight Committee, uh, we've done a tremendous job in raising money for how to do all these things. Um, in the last couple minutes, I'll share a little bit about tomorrow. So I mentioned the next 375 years um, I won't go through year by year and explain them all, but uh, one of the things that, that we funded was a topographical survey of the fort. Um, so this is how the fort uh, is situated today. We were able to take that topographical survey and compare it to the site plan, the detailed site plan that we had from 1840, I'm sorry, 1820. Uh, and you see the overlay. So the areas in red were the 1820 plan uh, overlaid on top of the site plan from today. This has enabled us to determine 
what's evolved over time at the fort. Uh, and also to see how we might change things um, in order to have the fort be more like it was back in 1820. We've done a number of things as we've gone through this process. One is um, involved the uh, there's a, a Center for Public Archaeology in the state. They've done 17 test pits at the fort. Uh, and haven't found anything significant, uh, but they will also be involved as we do a bit more excavation in the next phase of the project. Um, we've done some lighting tests to determine, and I think the lighting tests scared a number of people because they happen to be up at Halloween. And so I think people are convinced that the fort is haunted now, since all of a sudden lights showed up where there never were lights before. So I apologize if it caught you unawares. Uh, but we are planning for lighting inside the fort, and that'll be something that you notice when we're done with the project. The other thing that we completed was a ground penetrating radar survey of the fort. Um, this is one of the, the readouts from that survey. Um, the areas in red here, it may not be easy for you to see, but these red areas uh, were disturbed earth that were the gun emplacements. Um, at the fort. So the area was compacted by the presence of the cannons. Uh, so that was pretty interesting. There were also a few um, foundations that we didn't know about that we found as part of the survey as well. Um, so a rather interesting results that came up. Just to give you a sense of what things are going to look like, if you stepped inside the fort today, and turn to the left, you see the path that goes up the hill to the left. Well, what I'll show you is um, our artist's rendition of what that pathway will look like going forward. So if you see the way the hillside looks and the, the roadway going up, you'll see that we're putting in a retaining wall and then lowering the pathway, uh, which will reduce the grade and make it ADA compliant on the left-hand side. Uh, so it, it also will serve to uh, lessen the hill on the right, which will help us with some erosion problems. Uh, but the real purpose here is, again, if I look at it that way and see the reduction in the slope will make it much easier to get up to the top of the fort. The same in the upper layout at the fort, um, this is uh, standing by the benches. If you went up the stairway to the furthest left side, if you as you walked up the fort, looking back across again, you see the lighthouse on the far left. Um, the stairway that's in the middle of the screen goes away, that one. The stairway that's here goes away, and a third stairway that would be over to the right goes away and we end up with a gun platform um, that was how the guns were presented uh, during 1820. So we have decided not to put in a, the stone wall here. We're just gonna use uh, the earthwork wall with grass on it, uh, but there will be a, a drop off of about 30 inches from the summit of the earthwork to the base of the gun platform. So that's part of the plan for the future. Um, this is the proposed plan that you'll see um, on the sign heading up to the fort. So again, this is the path that leads you up to the entrance to the fort. This would be where that swinging gate is today. Uh, in the future, if you bear to the right, you have an option of going up a stairway here and walking around the fort as you would today, or taking the path, the uh, uh, ramp that will take you up to the ramparts that way. So this is running behind the restroom building that would then be accessible back to this area and all the way around to the other stairway here. Or you can go into the left, up this ramp all the way up to the area by the benches to the top of the stairway here and then back down through the gun platform 
and back down the hill. Um, and then there's also a path here that will take you to the rooms at the fort. So again, this is a crushed stone path um, that is uh, ADA compliant so that you can get inside the fort, the thresholds, uh, the, the level of the floor is gonna match the threshold so that you can enter if you are mobility challenged and get inside the fort. Last couple of pictures. Again, a beautiful shot of the tree and looking back at the town. We will replace the split rail fence um, that you see in this photo. And it will be split rail down at this part of the fort just because of the steep drop off. We needed a more substantial fence. Um, there's lots of things that have that happen at the fort on a regular basis, including Glover's Regiment's annual encampment. Um, the Arts Festival has its champagne reception up there. On the 4th of July, Glover's Regiment firing a cannon, and, and we're happy to report that we'll be firing the new reproduction cannon at the fort uh, going forward, so starting next year. Um, how do you follow along? Uh, so if a number of people are interested in knowing, uh, you know, following the progress of the construction work, um, that information is available um, on the town website. So if you go to marblehead.org, uh, there is a Fort Sewell Oversight Committee page. Uh, it's not too late. If you want to sponsor or be part of this process uh, at this point, there are 151 names going on the plaque at Fort Sewell. And to get your name on the plaque, uh, it's a $1,000 donation. Uh, so at $1,000, you would be a sergeant. Uh, we have a lot of ranks, so I, I'm sure there's probably a potential general out there that's on this call. Uh, and for the low, low $50,000 donation, you can be named a general on the plaque at the fort. Um, but folks in town have been immensely generous. Um, we have at present time, 77 sergeants, uh, 37 lieutenants, 15 captains, 11 majors, 12 colonels, I'm sorry, seven colonels and one general. Uh, so uh, that generosity uh, is most appreciated. Uh, so if you were interested in donating, you can, call the selectman's office, 631-0000, and they can help you with that process. Or um, you can go to marblehead.org and the Fort Sewell Oversight Committee, the Fort Sewell Donation Fund information is there. Uh, you can just print it off and send in a check. <laughs> long enough. So I'm happy to answer questions. Um, Lauren, I didn't, I lost my ability to check on the chat. Oh, well, um, let me, we'll um, right now. Will we there be did... handicapped? Yes. Okay. Okay. I, I see a few questions. I'll, I'll run okay. through those real quick. Yep, Will there be I'll... handicapped access to the binoculars? Yes, we actually have plans for new binoculars uh, up on the top of the fort uh, that will have um, handicapped binocular as well as uh, the other binocular with it. So yes, there will be handicap access to binoculars, not handicap access to the binocular that's there now, but there will be new binoculars at the top of the fort. Uh, is there any? Uh, there's a question, is there any World War II U-boat experience off Fort Sewell or the neck that you've learned about? Uh, not that I've learned about. I do, there certainly were coast watchers um, looking for U-boats off the fort. Uh, I haven't seen anything that they saw them, uh, but I would certainly stand corrected if there's anybody that does know that. And then the next question is, why, why did the fort get its name, Fort Sewell? Uh, fort Sewell is named for Judge Samuel Sewell who was um, from Marblehead and was on the Massachusetts Supreme Court. Uh, I honestly don't know the years that he served, 
but I believe he was a judge. Well, I won't say that. I, I, since I don't know the answer, I know that it's Judge Sewell, but I couldn't tell you the years that he served. Yeah, he was, I believe he was late 17th century because he has, if it's, uh, excuse me, um, did I get that wrong? Samuel Sewell. Yeah, so I think that it's, uh, he's pretty early on in the town. I think Is he the, was one of the judges during the witch trials. Witch trial. I, mm -hmm. I think that's the case. Can I interrupt and just say that was 1800 that it was named for him? And that was the year he was appointed to the Massachusetts Supreme Court. And he was actually appointed Chief Justice in 1814. And that was the year he died as well. He was only Chief Justice for six so he, months. He's the descendant of this, of the- um, Yes, of exactly. The, uh, gosh, I can't even. The Salem Witch Trial, Samuel Sewell. He's the descendant yes. of him and the general court. Great, two generations, yes. two generations down. So was there, was there a significance to 1644 that they wanted to, I guess, build a fort or establish that? Did anything happen or was it just general protection? Um, I believe it was general protection at that point. You know, we had a um, huge industry in fishing from here uh, and later on in trade. Uh, so it was to protect uh, the nautical presence that we had. That was part of the reason, you know, there were pirates and everything at that point in time. Um, so having this protection at the mouth of the harbor, it was, that was part of the reason for it then. There's another reason also because England was in a civil war at that time. And so France would have easily taken advantage of the colonies. And that was a big concern right, right at that point in the 1640s. In 1644 is the same year the Marblehead's first constable was appointed, and 1649, as most people know, is when we were incorporated. So it was a formative time, but the English Civil War had a lot to do with that because we were much more vulnerable to France. I'm going to keep asking questions because we did get a lot on the chat. There's yes. a question about, will people in wheelchairs, will they have a clear view because of the benches that are going in? Uh, the benches. Yes. Okay. No, the benches will be behind the pathway. So just like they are today, the, the wheelchairs will actually be in front of the benches. Okay, great. So and they should have a clear view. Andrew asks, will Shakespeare be back? I assume you mean Shakespeare in the park? I don't oh, know. the Rebel Shakespeare. Rebel no. Shakespeare, sorry. Yes, Rebel Shakespeare. I do not know that. Um, and I assume that you know the same considerations for the town for use of town properties would be applied. And I, again, I think some of the challenge was insurance and uh, whether town property should be used for a, a money-making enterprise. But um, I'm sure that the town would consider something like that um, if uh, if asked. So I, I haven't heard anybody lobbying for that, but uh, I'm sure it's something that, like anything, we would consider it. Awesome. Okay, great. I'm going to keep going. So we have a suggestion. This is a suggestion. Could we plant a new future iconic tree in the location where the original was? I know that you, you mentioned there are newer trees going in. Is one going in the exact same location as the iconic tree? Uh, it will be close to that. Um, it's... The ramp will be close to that as well, but um, there are, so for all the trees that we had to remove, we are adding more trees than that. Uh, so the hope is that we will provide something that's sturdy enough to last that long. Awesome. So that is part of the plan is you, what you'll see is the upper part of the fort will be a bit more fort-like and there really weren't very many trees up there already. The lower part is a little bit more park-like because it's been uh, shadier, you know, had more trees and we will continue that um, as we go forward so that there, is, there are plans to replace the trees that have been removed so far. Awesome. In some of your earlier photos that you showed of the fort, there was a house-like structure. Um, any idea what that was? I don't know if we can go go back to that or not, but if you do you have any idea what the use of that building was? Um, I don't, I wonder if Dan Dixie might know that one. I can find the picture. 
yeah, you want to, um, you I'll can. go back to that. Yeah, yep. perfect. And if anybody uh, wants to unmute themselves and chime in, feel free. I think that's the picture. Um, there. This one was, uh, let's see, it was um, Brian who had the question. If you want to feel free to unmute yourself, Brian, if, if you want to clarify. Yeah, I was curious. Um, it, Larry had said there's no housing around there. I just wondered if there's a house or some kind of other structure. So the yeah, structure so it, below the fort. Yeah. It does look like a house. Um, I know there was a restaurant there at one point, but um, today there are houses all over this property up to the left-hand side. There was the two, the first two houses built were the one up at the point uh, at the top part of the fort. And then there was one right next to the entrance to the fort. So those were the, the first two that were built on the rest of the property. This, I believe, I honestly don't know. I, I know there was a restaurant there at one point in time. Uh, I'm not sure, but this definitely looks more house-like. Right, right. I know the, the Adams House restaurant was on Fort Beach, I think a little bit farther down at one yeah, point. I think you're right. They had an extent, the, the Adams House extension was there as a restaurant for a while, mm. where that little house is. They had the this, two. The little one? The where that little house is. It, it was a different different building, though. It wasn't that little. Mm. I mean, that, look, that looks like a house in that one. But mm -hmm. Yeah. Did anyone ever fire at the fort? Was there any uh, occasion where guns were fired? Not that I know of. I don't know, uh, Judy Anderson, whether you've ever heard of anything being fired at the fort. Um, I know no. there. Are, well, go ahead. There are shots fired every year at Glover's Regiment encampment, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> not um, not I in anger Rhodes, that I know of. Rhodes would have put it in if there had been, and you know, up to that point anyway, which is 1877 and 1890. But it, it would have been in the town records, probably. So probably not, although. Uh, a vessel did explode in the harbor, the, the Freemason, in, eight, in 1777, and shrapnel would have been flung, but that's about it. And the question came early on when you were showing the picture of Glover's regiment and you mentioned them being called back to duty in, in 1975. Uh, was there a reason that that year they got called back? Uh, yes, in preparation for the bicentennial. Great. Um, so they were called back to duty at the end of 1974, uh, and they did an awful lot of recruiting and drilling and outfitting themselves in 75 and followed the footsteps of the original regiment through the bicentennial, through all the reenactments that year. Great. So I have, somebody has raised their hand in the chat. I don't have a name associated, it just says iPad. I'm going to go ahead and unmute you if you have a question. Do you know who you are if you raised your hand? Does anybody else have a question they want to unmute themselves? You can um, do it down at the bottom of your screen, the bottom left, you should have a mute button or in the chat. Hello, this is Mary Gardner. I just uh, wrote in a question in the chat. Yes. Oh, sure. Chat with you. So I'm wondering if um, when you're putting in trees, are you putting in the traditional trees or are you expanding um, the horizons and maybe putting in some ginkgo trees, which yeah. would be very, very healthy there and, and withstand the um, storms and rain? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, we do have a um, an landscape architect firm that's working with us. Mm -hmm. And I honestly don't know what yeah. type of trees they're planting, but I can check with them. Okay. Hey Larry, this is Deborah Smith and Mike Smith. Thanks for the fabulous presentation. Um, Mike has a question. Uh, hey Larry, uh, I was born and bred in Marblehead and I've never been in the fort. Uh, but are the rooms, are there going to be rooms open into the actual fort when you get finished? Thanks for the question, Mike. Yes, absolutely. So all of the rooms in the fort, um, Glover's Regiment has volunteered to, to build furniture for the inside of the fort. 
So we've outfitted some of the rooms uh, in recent years. We will outfit the entire fort um, so that when we take people through on tours, uh, it'll give you a sense of what things were like back in the, uh, the early 1800s. Uh, so that's part of the plan. That's terrific. Uh, all right, just one interesting question. The, the doors there, would they be, would, did they have glass behind them or what? Or they just got uh, bars? Uh, there, are, there are wooden doors uh, that close and bolt normally. Uh, we've had some problems with warping for the replacement yeah. doors. So we have the bars um, just so that we can open the doors to dry it out inside. But yeah. we're, uh, the, the doors on the front of the fort now are out being straightened. Uh, and then we're replacing the doors up at the top of the fort. So all of them will have doors, presumably that close by the time we're done. Uh, and they'll have bars as well that open up uh, so that we can open the doors. Thank, thank you so much. I love this presentation. Oh, good. Well, I'm glad you joined us. Thank you. And Larry, um, when, when the fort was actually in use, was it mostly marble headers or were there federal soldiers or, or United States soldiers that used it? Um, mostly marble headers. Uh, it's interesting, you know, when you think of uh, Glover's regiment uh, was outfitted, there were 500 men from Marblehead uh, that went to serve during the revolution, which was a huge percentage of our population at that point. Um, and we were uh, definitely among the first to provide volunteers for the uh, for the War of 1812, as well as for um, the Civil War. Uh, so Marblehead had plenty of recruits, also the Spanish-American War, actually. Um, so there were lots of recruits from Marblehead that served there. There also was um, a squad assigned to the fort. Uh, I think there were 40 men assigned there, uh, along with the captain of the fort that lived in town. Um, so during some of these up, uh, uprisings, um, there were, it wasn't just troops that went other places, there were those that stayed behind to, to man the fort. Great, I think I got everybody's question, Mary. I'm sorry I missed yours, I'm glad you spoke up. Um, anything else? Any other comments, questions? Can I add to what you just said? Um, yes. Marblehead Light Infantry was actually a, a body, a US body, um, United States Army body, not quite with the Army, but sort of, who were stationed up there in the War of 1812. And there were about 100 or 121, I can't remember the number. During the War of 1812, there were 1,100, 1,121 people who served in the War of 1812 from Marblehead and a population of about a thousand families. So that's pretty huge and half of them were POWs, but part of that was the Marblehead Light Infantry there. And in the revolution, the fort was famously, quote, manned by civilians. So yeah, Marbleheader is there. And I guess, Larry, your mother-in-law's home was um, where the commander of the fort was stationed? Yes, yeah, at, at some point and there were I think shutters that were, I mean, the, the urban legend is there are shutters that were made by the soldiers from the fort. So, uh, I don't know that for certain, uh, but there also was additional property up around Fort Sewell. I mentioned that there weren't a lot of houses up there. Um, and some of the landowners, it was fish flakes mostly, but some of the landowners leased land to the government so that they could train troops up there as well during the, the Civil War. Wonderful. Anything else? Yeah. Any um, prisoners? We just got a question. Do you, do you have two seconds? Or if there aren't any other questions? We have one um, more question. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Prisoners, there, yes. There were prisoners that were held there for a brief period of time. Uh, there is a dungeon. So in the, the room that's to the right as you're facing the fort, um, there's a dungeon that kind of goes underneath the hillside, underneath that steep stairway. 
uh, and there were some prisoners that were kept there for a short period of time. It's a pretty dismal place under there. <laughs> I don't think I would have wanted to stay there for very long, uh, but but there there were some that were kept there. Judy? I think a very interesting aspect of this fort is that for every time there was a major conflict, um, 1705 was Queen Nan's War, um, 1740s was King George's War, there were plans drawn for this fort by United States or English um, military engineers, professional military engineers. Um, so that's, I think, pretty cool. And one of the major renovations that brought it to the appearance we see today is was in the 1790s and that renovation also had military engineers um, involved that there is not a plan for that period but that's what the 1820 plan documents was the enlargement and renovations from the 1790s so i think it's really fascinating that our fort was important enough to have military engineers involved in all of the major renovation phases Last question for you, Larry. When was the work? When is the work scheduled to be completed? That's an excellent question. <laughs> the, plan, <laughs> the, the current projects will be completed by the end of September. Oh, good. Um, so okay. everything is underway. Unless we have any unanticipated COVID delays or anything like that, um, the, the fort should be reopened by the end of September. Great. Well. I want to thank you, Larry, so much for, um, for the great talk and for sharing your, all the information with us. I want to thank everybody else for joining us tonight, and I hope I'll see you at the June 6 Marblehead Memories meeting. Again, you can find out more information on our website, marbleheadmuseum.org. And thanks again to Marble Harbor Investment Council for sponsoring our entire lecture series. So stay well, everybody. Thank you so much and take care. Thanks, Lauren. Good night, everybody.